The Mac Studio is part of something very rare indeed, a whole brand new product line from Apple. Right now it consists of the Mac Studio mini desktop and the studio display. So the real question is, who is it for? I've been able to spend some time with the new Mac Studio and studio display. I will say about the Mac Studio, it impressed me, but it didn't surprise me. And that's because the configuration that I tested is virtually identical to the 16 inch MacBook Pro that I tested late in 2021. They both have that M1 Max chip. It's a combination CPU and GPU, Apple Silicon that's in all new Macs and some new iPads. And both of these devices are really targeted at creatives, people who make uh, videos, they shoot, they edit, they're music producers, maybe they make podcasts. So that creative class that needs something more than just you know a standard Mac mini, which was kind of the go-to for many years uh, for people who wanted to have, let's say, a computer in their recording studio. The big difference, of course, is that a MacBook Pro is an all-in-one self-contained system. You have the Apple Silicon, you have the display, the keyboard, touchpad, everything. You just pack it and go. Whereas the Mac Studio, it's a small desktop. You could technically disconnect it, put it in a bag and take it with you. People did that with Mac Minis a lot over the years, but it's really meant to be in one place connected to a separate display and a separate keyboard and a separate mouse or touchpad. Now it's interesting because even just a couple of months ago, that M1 Max chip was really the top dog when it came to Apple's own chips. They're trying over the course of a couple of years to phase out Intel chips, phase in their own. They started with the M1, then they added the M1 Pro and M1 Max. Well, now for the Mac Studio, yes, they have the M1 Max and that's the version I tested, but they also have a new chip called the M1 Ultra, which is basically two M1 Maxes stuck together. So when you get a Mac Studio, you can choose which base model you want. For $2,000, you get the M1 Max, and for $4,000, you get the M1 Ultra. Now, my first inclination was to kind of write off that $2,000 M1 Max version is not really ambitious enough for real creative pros, and also to uh, look at the $4,000 M1 Ultra version and say, wow, that's really expensive for something that is not upgradable. You can't open it up and put new parts inside. And that audience that wants to spend that much, maybe they're looking for a Mac Pro. Maybe they're waiting for the next version of the Mac Pro. So this might not be the device for them. But after talking to some other creatives, I actually heard the opposite from some of them, that the M1 Max version of the Mac Studio or even the Ultra version is exactly the kind of middle ground that they might be looking for if you were an aspiring filmmaker, a developing music producer, and you wanted to do more than you could with simply an M1 device like a MacBook Air or a Mac Mini, then spending $2,000 or more on a Mac Studio and $1,500 and up for the uh, companion display actually seems like a reasonable investment if you're ready to step up, but you're not quite in the Mac Pro territory yet. And even if you are in the Mac Pro territory, that's one of those devices that has not been updated from Intel to Apple Silicon yet. Even though Apple has teased it, we're gonna to have to come back later this year. That's the real question mark hovering over all of this. Maybe even more interesting than the Mac Studio is the other new product it's paired with, the Studio Display. It's Apple's first new display since the super expensive, super fancy XDR and it has its own chip in it, something that I don't think I've seen in a display before. This has an A13 chip from Apple, the same thing that was in, I think, the iPhone 11. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to have a webcam built in that does its own center stage. That's the uh, Apple utility where the webcam can kind of zoom in and follow your face around while you're in a Zoom meeting or a FaceTime call. And it also does spatial audio and that's built right into the display. And if you have a compatible computer, plug it in and you'll be able to take advantage of those extra features. Now, if you remember that XDR display, the big professional Apple display started at like $5,000 and you definitely needed the sold separately thousand dollar stand to go with it. This is a more reasonable $1599, includes the stand, although there are of course some stand upgrades you could pay extra for. So far, I have only tested the M1 Max version of the Mac Studio, not the M1 Ultra version. It's also interesting that that Ultra version is actually heavier by about two pounds, even though the cases are the same size. And that's because it's got a heavier heat sink inside, I think made of copper instead of aluminum. In either case, in both models, about half the volume is just fans and cooling stuff anyway. So there's a lot of that going on in here. So besides the look, it's a square with gently rounded corners. There's actually not a lot in common between the old Mac Mini and the new Mac Studio. 
I said initially that the studio was kind of like two minis stacked on top of each other. It's actually more than that. The studio is about 3.7 inches high and the old Mac mini is about 1.4 inches. So it's actually taller than that even. And of course, huge price difference. The Mac mini starts at $700, this guy $2,000 and up. I'd almost kind of like to see an M1 Pro version of the Mac Studio to give it even more in-between options for people. Now note that the configuration I tested is a few steps up from even that $2,000 base. It adds uh, 64 gigs of RAM, it's got two terabytes of storage, and it's got the version of the M1 Max with 32 graphic scores instead of 24. All that adds up to about $3,200, but you have to pick your upgrades carefully when you're ordering in the first place because this is a totally sealed system. There are no user accessible parts inside. You can't upgrade it after the fact unless you plug something in externally through one of the USB-C ports. And that's probably the biggest sticking point for a certain type of potential Mac Studio purchaser. Uh, if you're a real power user, if you're the kind of person who has a big desktop set up or you either have or wanted to get a Mac Pro, the real appeal there is you can take last year's graphics card out and put a new one in. Your hard drive is getting too small, you can take it out, put a larger one in, put a faster one in. Obviously, in systems like this, you can't do that. It's also interesting to note that I took the 16-inch MacBook Pro and configured it the exact same way with the same amount of storage and RAM and the upgraded M1 Max chip, and that came out to about $4,300. So that's the extra premium you're paying for getting everything in a very portable laptop package. Here, you even have to buy the keyboard and touchpad or mouse separately. And of course, Apple has a new variation on the Magic Keyboard and the Magic Mouse and the Magic Touchpad. That Magic Keyboard with a number pad built in, uh, it's got a new gray and silver design, 200 bucks. The touchpad, 150, and the Magic Mouse itself is 100. Now, as a longtime Mac user and an even longer time PC user, I will say that touchpads, especially that Apple Magic touchpad, is just one of my favorite input devices of all time. Meanwhile, the Magic Mouse is one of my least favorite. I think that one of the biggest innovations in the Mac Studio is one of the most basic. They took some of the ports and connections on the back and they moved them onto the front of the system. For years, not just Apple, a lot of computer makers have been hiding all their ports in the back, on the sides. Uh, it keeps it out of the way, but it's also hard to get to them. So I really like that they took two USB ports and the SD card slot and moved them right to the front of the system. On the M1 Max version of this, they're just USB-C ports. If you get the M1 Ultra version, for some reason, they're also Thunderbolt ports. We've really come a long way from the nadir of Mac design, where sometimes we had systems that just had one USB port for the entire thing. Power, accessories, everything else. I'm glad we don't live in that world anymore. When it comes to benchmark testing, I was not expecting anything radically different than what we got when we tested the M1 Max last year in the form of a 16-inch MacBook Pro. Both the MacBook and the Mac Studio had the version of the M1 Max chip with 10 CPU cores and 32 GPU cores. They both had 64 gigs of RAM, which is really a lot. Now, I may not be a high-end creative pro all the time, but during COVID, I've taken to shooting a lot of my own videos, sometimes editing it, usually in 4K. I've certainly done plenty of uh, music studio production. I occasionally design stuff for 3D printing in CAD programs. And I found, of course, that the performance between the M1 Max in the MacBook Pro we tested last year and the M1 Max in this new Mac Studio, very, very similar. Uh, the Mac Studio version was actually a little bit faster, which I attribute to the better cooling because, again, half of the whole thing is basically devoted to cooling. But what we also have to talk about is the companion piece for the Mac Studio, and that is the Studio Display, which is by itself big news because it's Apple's first new display in a long time. I kind of originally saw it as a lower cost alternative to that Pro XDR display, and it is in some ways, and it isn't in other ways. At about $1,600, it's certainly much more attainable than the $5,000 and up XDR, but it also doesn't have all the same features, doesn't have all the bells and whistles. It's not quite a true Pro level display in the same way that the XDR is. Uh, that XDR has a mini LED screen. This is just a regular IPS display. Uh, the studio display does not support HDR content, and it doesn't have that ProMotion variable refresh rate that some of the newer MacBooks and iPads have. It's basically a 60 hertz display and that's it. Looking at them side by side, the studio display and the XDR, there was actually a lot of good consistency in the color between the two going through the different reference modes, but we're gonna have a deeper dive into the studio display soon.
What I really liked about the studio display was some of those A13 tricks built in, especially center stage, which has become very useful on iPads, especially if you're in a lot of web video meetings, Zoom meetings, FaceTime meetings, like a lot of us are these days. Uh, what center stage lets you do is you move around a little bit, you reframe yourself, and the camera does that for you. It's actually shooting a very wide image and just kind of zooms in and pans within that image to keep you in frame. I set it up, I tested it with a few other people where we spread out and the, the image zoomed out to capture all of us. Uh, other people moved off, it zoomed back in on me. I moved in closer, it kept up with me and back. So it was actually very responsive, worked very well. And of course, you won't be able to access any of that stuff if you plug this into a Windows machine. It should technically work as a monitor, but number one, you're not going to have access to any of the system controls because they're all software based. There are no buttons or anything anywhere on the studio display. And of course, you won't be able to use things like center stage. So what are we left with? Apple would like you to think of the Mac Studio and Studio Display as a package. They come together and you can get into that package. It'll cost you at least $3,500, probably more frankly, but they are two products designed to work together and they have a lot of synergies between them. Of course, once you start adding extras like more RAM, more storage space, even the height adjustable stand on the studio display versus just the tilting one is an extra $400. So of course, things can get more expensive very quickly. But we're still in that in-betweener zone, people who have outgrown a regular M1 system, but they're not quite ready for a Mac Pro, or they're waiting to see what the next Mac Pro is. That's really the biggest question mark out there. So I am reserving judgment in a way until we see what that next generation Mac Pro is, because that truly is what the highest of high-end professionals are looking for. I'm also reserving judgment on the M1 Ultra version of this product until I get a chance to check one of those out and test it myself. So that leads us back here with the M1 Max version of the Mac Studio and the Studio Display. It falls somewhere in between a hypothetical new Mac Pro at some point in the future and the regular M1 systems you might have outgrown. And I see this appealing mostly to people whose budget and whose needs, again, fall somewhere between those two extremes. If you want to read our full review of the Mac Studio and Studio Display, find out more. Links are right down there in the description below.